Hello, dog lovers. I'm Nancy, and I am the program manager for Great Barrington Kennel Club, which is based out of Western Massachusetts. I am delighted to tell you that we are hosting Dr. Jaylene Harris, who is an imaging resident at Cornell University Vet School. And she's the one who has everything interesting to say, so I'm going to turn it over to her. Awesome, thank you. Um, my internet is a bit slow at home, so I'm gonna stop my video, but hopefully, um, let me share my screen first, just to make sure everyone can see it. I'll keep an eye on the chat too, if there are any questions. Yes, and please interrupt if there's questions or post them in the chat and Nancy can interrupt me. Um, I don't tend to look at that as I go. Okay, did that share? Yes, you're sharing. This big one? The, you have, yes, Imaging Anatomy, Great Barrington Kennel Club. Oh, perfect, okay. Let me then figure out how to pause my video just so my internet will actually load. Oh no. Lower right. Stop video. Okay. Oh, and now that I'm hosted, I will admit people as well. So that's fine. You were, you just talk and I'll worry about adding people in. Okay, great. Okay, so yes, we will go over imaging anatomy. Um, again, uh, my name is Jaylene. I go by Jay though. So if you have a question, just holler out. Um, so I am from, so I'm from Montana, um, North Central, so right close to the Canadian border, and I've had some experience um, with training dogs, so I've had a St. Bernard when I was in 4-H and FFA when I was young um, and did obedience with her, and then my two current dogs, I've had a couple Border Collies and then my healer as well, um, and we've just done some obedience. My um, Border Collie mix right now is in scent work, which is um, how, I, how I know Nancy. Um, so then I went to undergrad in Montana as well, doing animal science, uh, did vet school um, in Colorado. And then I did a couple internships, both small animal and um, large animal down in Texas. Um, I also did, while I was in Texas for a year, a master's degree, but it was online out of the University of Florida. And that was actually in uh, veterinary forensics. So I have a special kind of heart for like the abuse cases and things like that. And then now I'm up in New York, um, up at Cornell, um, where I'm doing my imaging residency. So I'm already a doctor, I'm already a veterinarian, but I am going to specialize in imaging, which is why um, I'm the person to talk today. One, I, I have a fondness for dog training, but I also um, like imaging. So just in case you do hear these guys in the background, I'm sorry, um, but these are my pets and they are amazing. Um, so that way, when you hear them, you, you might know who they are, I guess. Okay, um, we'll start out with just a few different things to make sure you know how things are gonna be oriented, oriented on the screen. So how we hang an image and all, everything I'm gonna talk about is gonna be x-rays. So how we actually, hang an x-ray or like put it on our screen for it to make sense to us because if we standardize this then um, lesions or abnormalities are going to become um, more apparent uh, quicker. So one thing is no matter which kind of direction we take an x-ray the head is always going to be up towards the top of our screen or to the left of our screen. Um, and that's especially if we're doing like a full body or just the chest or just the abdomen. If we're on the leg, it still um, hangs that, that direction. So for example, I have this elbow here and here. So in this case, the elbow can hang where it looks like the dog is standing or it can look like the dog is kind of laying down, um, but everything else is gonna be still head up towards the sky or head over to the left of the image. Um, okay, and then labeling. Um, this it won't be super important for some of our images, but just in case you do see them, um, we label images based on um, how the dog, I guess, is positioned. So for example, if the dog is laying on its back or on its belly, it doesn't matter which one, we act as if we're looking from the top down, right? We're much taller than dogs, and so we kind of tower over them. Well, this, oh, go back. 
uh, this dog's uh, right side is over on the left of our screen, right? So every time we label and hang an image, the dog's right is always going to be to the left. So this is the right side of the chest and this is the left side of the chest. Um, similarly, though, if the dog is going to lay on its side, like this little guy, we're going to label what side he is laying on. So the head, again, is always to the left, but he's laying on his left side. And that's going to be the same if he's laying on his right side. This will show an R, but his head is still going to be positioned over here. Um, okay, so we have different shades of gray within an x-ray, and there's five of them um, that go from the most black, which is radiolucent. Oh, I keep skipping, and I don't know why. Sorry, guys. Um, to the most white, which is radio opaque. So lucent is black, opaque is white. And the things that are going to be the most radiolucent is going to be air or gas. And then we have fat, soft tissue and fluid, bone and metal. Um, so metal is the, the most opaque material. And just to reiterate this, I have an example of um, all of these opacities. So gas that we see is dark, it's within uh, the small intestine. It's also outside here on our image, right? There's The x-ray beam isn't going through any tissue right here, so it's completely black. Um, whereas fat is gonna be dark, but not black. And then soft tissue, like this little spleen or this muscle in the hind limb, is a little bit more white. We go to bone that's even a little bit more whiter than that. And then, of course, metal. So those are our five opacities that we'll kind of talk about. Um, OK, so today is all about the musculoskeletal skeletal system. So I don't really talk about um, abdomen or chest, um, but mainly uh, bones and muscles. Um, okay, so, oh, it just skipped again. I'm sorry, I don't know why it's doing this. Did it go back? We see no. find the six-year-old Doxy. Okay, hold on. Let me go back then. Okay, sorry. So first we'll start off with, and I'll, the kind of the way I'll present these is the disease and then a patient and a normal. A lot of these patients are kind of that typical um, breed or size of dog. And then we'll go through a normal set of x-rays and then what the disease looks like and how we treat that. So intervertebral disc disease, um, it starts, it's a disease of truly the spinal cord and the disc. The spinal cord is one of the most imp important structures um, and it's protected by the spinal column or the bony spine. Um, but between these vertebra, between the, the uh, spinal segments are these discs. And the outer side of the disc, the dark blue, it's called, a, it's a fibrous ring. So it has really thick, um, kind of structure to it, but the inside of these discs are really soft and spongy, kind of like toothpaste almost. Um, and so discs can uh, degenerate either with age or with um, motion, and it can either have the outer part, the fibrous part degenerate, causing the disc to escape, which is shown in the right photo, or it can actually have, um, changes to the actual nucleus, that inner uh, kind of pulpy bit, if you will, um, that causes uh, the whole disc to be bad, if you will. So you can see the spinal cord in yellow is happy in the left, all the discs are in place, but when this disc gets degenerative and ruptures, as we call it, um, it slips between the vertebra and enters into the spinal column and compresses that um, spinal cord. And that's why we see um, the kind of the, the signs that we see. So dogs can be very painful. They can be a little bit wobbly in their legs. They can completely lose function of their legs. It just depends on how severe um, that compression is. Um, most commonly, we're going to see this, uh, the dachshund is the poster child, right? They're super long backs um, for their short little legs. 
but we can see it in poodles, German shepherds, Dobermans, and cocker spaniels are also common. Um, so for example, this was gonna be one of the spine. Um, this is a little dachshund, a six year old female spade dachshund. Um, so the owner has noticed weakness of the hind limbs for about three months, but last night when the when she was running up the stairs, she yelped and then wasn't able to use her back legs at all. And this is a very, very common history that we kind of have these slow progressive signs and then it's either stairs or jumping on and off the bed is also super, super common. Um, and then they're just not able to, to move correctly. Um, so looking at an x-ray, um, Oh, oops, I oriented this one wrong. <laughs> I messed up the head. <laughs> Sorry, guys. In this image is over here. <laughs> I shouldn't have. <laughs> Normally it's flipped. I must have messed this up big time, but we can still see what we need to see. Um, the vertebra are these uh, single bony segments, and in between them are these disc spaces. Well, this disc space is nice and lucent. It's black. Um, which is normal and it has a decent amount of space between the two um, vertebra but this one has the disc that is mineralized this one has a disc that's mineralized here's a little bit here's probably the worst one in this dog and here's another this one has a little bit of uh, mineralization or opaqueness these look like bone right they're the same color the same opacity as the bone next to it that's because they are literally being filled with mineral, um, which is what bone is made out of. Um, this little, oh my gosh, I don't know why it does that. Uh, this little disc, you can actually see it because it's well mineralized. You can see it coming up into the spinal cord and which is not normal there. I can almost guarantee you just based off of this X-ray that the cord is gonna be pinched at least at this level, if not others as well. You commonly, like this one could also be pinching the spinal cord. It's just the disc isn't fully mineralized. So this is commonly seen. The other thing that we will see is just a collapsed space where these two vertebra actually have no space between them and they're just side by side. Um, so that's intervertebral disc disease. How we treat this, um, it's sometimes surgical. So, oh, there's a chat. Uh, yeah, I can't see the chat. Oh, that's because, okay, hold on. Oh, wait a second here. There we go. Yes. Spaniels, one of my breeds are also posted children for disc issues. They sure are. That is, that's accurate. Yeah, so there's a lot of breeds that can get this. And surprisingly, I mean, don't get me wrong, corgis can get it, but surprisingly, the longback little corgis aren't as common as dachshunds, which is weird to me, but... Um, one of the ways we fix this is we start them on anti-inflammatories because the reason we have these issues is because the spinal cord is really angry and really inflamed. If it's mild, that that can actually be treated. And then we'll cage rest them and we'll decrease activity. But when it's um, pretty, when it's moderate or severe and there's quite a bit of compression, we actually have to go into the vertebral column, into the spine and cut a hole to relieve pressure. One, it relieves pressure. So the spinal cord can be angry, get swollen and inflamed and have room to do so and not be so compressed. But not only that, by doing this, we can reach in there and grab the disc material if it's um, uh, disconnected from the disc. Okay, we'll move on to hip dysplasia. Um, so this is a deformity of the hip that occurs during growth. Um, so the hip is a ball and socket joint. Um, and during growth, both of them, the ball and the socket part have to grow at equal rates. Um, this uniform growth, um, the hip dysplasia is what happens when this growth is not uniform. And this is commonly occur, commonly occurs in puppies. And if these aren't uniform, it's gonna cause a looseness or laxity of the joint um, and can cause uh, basically arthritis around this and it can cause um, luxation and subluxation. And we'll kind of, we'll go through those and, and what those kind of look like. Um, but one interesting thing is a dog can be not lame at all and come in, take x-rays and the hips look horrendous. 
On the other hand, the dog can be severely lame. We isolate it to the hip joint, we take x-rays, and there's the most small amount of changes. So really, the amount of change doesn't always correlate to how affected the dog actually is. Um, this is a genetic disease, um, and it's commonly effect affected by factors like di diet, exercise, um, growth rate, um, and then other hormones as well. So we see it commonly in puppies. Our poster child for this is going to be our, our big, fast, large growing, sorry, big, fast growing, large breed dogs, um, German Shepherds, St. Bernard's, Labs, Goldens, um, really any, any large breed dog is, is going to be kind of our poster child for this. Um, let's see, what else about this? Uh, well, yeah, we'll move on. Uh, okay, so these are some normal hips. So I wanted to show you kind of what this looks like. And I wanted to point out, um, this is our pelvis here with our two femurs. So our femur um, is the ball part of the ball and socket. And then our acetabulum of the pelvis is the socket part of the ball and socket. So femoral head and acetabulum. Um, and this is just a top-down view, whereas this is from the side. And so you can see both femurs coming up. And then here's our actual joint. Uh, these joints are smooth, margined. The neck of the femur is nice and thin. Um, and we'll go through how these can change when we have disease. Okay, so we're going to the hind limb hips. This is a two-year-old male neutered German Shepherd. Um, history is he started limping. Oh, on his, not her, on his right hind during a daily walk three days ago, and it's just not improved. So this is an example of mild hip dysplasia. So it doesn't look too abnormal compared to what we just saw, but um, from my trained eye, oh my goodness, why does it do that? From my train, I'm so sorry. From my trained eye, I can see that this is not nice and smooth. This acetabulum is actually coming up here and that ball of the femur doesn't fit within that acetabulum. It's really wide here. Also, something that we call a Morgan line is this litter, little opaque bright white line right here in the neck of that femur. Um, that is basically change and mineralization of where the, uh, um, what am I trying to call it? The joint capsule attaches. Um, so those are two kind of subtle findings, but we still have good shape of our acetabulum and our uh, femur. This is gonna be moderate. Um, in moderate disease, we still have that incongruity. So we still have the widening of the joint. Um, we may or may not have a Morgan line. Here's one right here. Um, and then we're also going to have some OA is going to be the short term for it, but it basically means um, inflammation and arthritis of the joint. And I can start to see, oh my, so sorry. I don't know why it's doing this. I can start to see that this is a little bit more irregular. Compare it to the other side, right? So this right hip is more affected. So I would call this right hip moderate and this left hip mild, but compared to this smooth margin um, of the neck of the femur, um, this guy is um, just a little bit lumpy bumpy. It also has a relatively straight head. So this femur is pretty round, right? That ball, the head of the femur is round and this guy is pretty straight. So that's common um, in moderate disease. This is a different dog, but another example of moderate disease. We still have kind of the lumpy bumpiness here. We have a little Morgan line. It's wide. This is even wider than some that we've seen. And this, you can almost see where this ball is actually almost not in that socket. That is called subluxation. So it's partial dislocation out of that socket joint. Um, two chats we can answer real quick. Lori says, my 11-year-old toy poodle was unable to lift his tail and was given anti-inflammatory meds. Whoops. 
I don't know where you just went. I saw it. Fortunately, it corrected the issue. Yeah, that is, so that's one of the common things is it's not just the legs that don't, and that was referring to disc disease, um, I'm assuming, but uh, commonly the tail is also affected and that would be pretty mild. Um, so yeah, anti-inflammatories is, is the way to go. So that, you know, doesn't need surgery. Um, and my breed greyhounds are actually very low risk for HD. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Um, I, yeah, I don't really think of a greyhound as a common hip dysplasia dog. Um, to say though, any breed is able to get this. It's just some are far less at risk and, and greyhounds are, are one of those. Um, okay, uh, going from moderate, we're gonna move on to severe. Okay, as you can tell, things are starting to get ugly, right? So not only do we have this irregularity of the femoral neck, but can you guys also notice that this looks way thicker than what the normal ones were. We're also starting to get new bone formation here. That's arthritis. We're starting to get new bone formation here of the acetabulum. And that acetabulum is no longer smooth. It's really irregular. The femoral heads are flattened. So even though this joint space isn't increased in width, there's a lot of change in these hips. When I look here though, compared to the last ones, it was just this thin little sliver of joint this joint is widened and we can see that on this other view. Um, and then very severe. Okay, so this is probably some, some of the worst. I've seen some really bad hips, but some of the worst hips I've seen, um, these are severely, I mean, you can't even tell this thing has a neck, right? Um, this is barely has a neck. Uh, the, everything is completely abnormal. I also wanna point out that that socket part of the joint is no longer nice and deep and doesn't have a true place for that femoral head to sit. You can see this kind of line here. That's because this is the only amount of the head that is in the acetabulum. So really this dog doesn't have much uh, stability to these joints at all. Um, so this is gonna be some, some really severe um, hip dysplasia. And I want to comment, any of those severities can happen truly at uh, a, a, var a variable amount of ages. So we might have a dog that has hip dysplasia and it's slowly progressive and he finally presents at six years old and it's mild. We might have a one-year-old dog that presents and it's very severe and that was just a very progress uh, progressive uh, disease in that animal. So it doesn't, age doesn't necessarily mean severity, but as we get, as the dog gets older, if they have any signs of hip instability, um, it, it will uh, get worse. So one uh, surgical treatment, so you can still do kind of anti-inflammatories and rest, uh, diet change, weight loss, um, physical therapy, things like that. But one of the things, one of the treatments is going to be an FHO, which is, oh, I have a question. In the previous slide, it appeared that the femur was bent or curved. Let me go back. Oh, yeah, this guy, it does look like that. Sometimes mm, it doesn't always happen with like, well, and we'll talk about angular limb deformities. Uh, I think that's the last example I give you guys. Sometimes the way we position these pets um, their hips are so painful that they're not straight. And so it, it gives the appearance that it is curved. I don't think this dog actually had a real curvature. I, I think it was just our positioning um, because his hips were so painful. Uh, going back to the FHO. So FHO stands for femoral head and neck osteectomy. So the, the head of the femur is actually removed and it's cut out right there at that red line and you just take, take it out and you leave it like that. Um, the cool thing is that in dogs, uh, oh, oh, I'll get there, okay. I'll, I'll pause right there and then we'll move on to the next one. Uh, another surgical treatment is gonna be a total hip replacement um, and this is gonna be with a synthetic uh, kind of joint capsule and then a metal implant. Um, so we can actually 
recreate a whole new hip. Um, this is also common in humans. If you get a total hip replacement. Oh, I didn't talk about it. Okay, I'm sorry about that. So the FHO is actually, it's way cool because um, dogs can fully run and live active lives. Um, it's a slow progression back to work because they, they still need to get used to this, right? And their muscles need to gain strength um, and kind of fibrose over and create scar tissue, but um, dogs do quite well. And actually you can do it on both sides and, and they still um, tend to be active dogs and, and don't look back. So that's, that's the cool thing about um, FHOs. Um, okay, we will move on to hip luxation. So luxation uh, literally means dislocation um, and luxation is a full displacement. So this hip on our right, the dog's left, um, is fully luxated, fully displaced. Whereas a subluxation like we saw in the other hips is only a partial movement or, or displacement. Um, this can occur due to hip dysplasia um, or trauma. So we do commonly see this, um, especially if there's fractures, if, if we have trauma like a, a hit by car or something like that. Um, okay, so we're still in the hind limb going on hip. We have a five-year-old male neutered border collie, um, a history of a non-weight bearing lameness, left hind after, um, oh, it still says her, getting his uh, leg stuck in a fence. So for example, this would be an example of a, a traumatic um, injury. Um, and we can see in the left image, it, the hip is not in that socket anymore. And we can wonder if it's partially dislocated or fully, but when we look at our view from the side, that hip, I mean, that femur, that head, the ball part of the femur is completely out in left field. Um, so that is a, a fully luxated hip. Um, so, couple things we can do um, is manual reduction. So this patient was manually reduced just by traction and us pulling on the leg, popped the hip back into the joint. Um, and that showed immediate resolution of uh, the luxation. Uh, but two days later, same dog came back in. What do you think the problem is? It's a hip luxation. <laughs> same thing happened. Oh, there's a... Another question, have you had any indication that the lameness due to Lyme disease can contribute to these conditions? Um, yeah, so Lyme disease, not necessarily um, luxation or dysplasia, but Lyme disease can cause inflammation within the joint uh, itself, like the joint fluid, the joint capsule, and then around the joint, you'll still show those extra bony formations um, because the, the joint is saying, I'm angry, I need to stabilize myself, let's put down more bone. So the answer is yes, but maybe not to the severity or to the, to the degree that we see, um, especially because once we treat that, it goes away um, and the, the bone stops remodeling that way. That's a great question. Um, so in this case, um, we manually reduced it, but then she came back in and it was out. So um, we can do, we can place surgical implants. Um, and this time we still manu manually reduced it. This was in surgery though. And then a toggle pin was placed. And this is just a little metallic wire-like implant to hold the hip there. Um, and I have a little schematic drawing of what it looks like and then what it looks like actually on the radiograph or on the x-ray. Um, so cool, this hip is back in place. Hopefully we have stabilized it. Um, lo and behold, though, two more days later, this day, I'm not making this up, but this patient came back in um, and it's out again. Um, this, is, this is not common. Usually, I mean, things can, uh, luxate again, but it to happen this many times is not as common, but um, if we can go in and do a uh, surgical ostectomy, which is that thing I was talking about, the FHO, where we just, we removed the head of the femur and it, it's not going to luxate anymore because it, it simply doesn't have the chance to. Um, so that, uh, that was kind of the end all fix for this patient. 
And sometimes we can decide which one to do based on the patient's age, the patient's weight, um, its activity level, um, how severe um, the changes around the hips are, um, and honestly, just the owners and, and, and what you know you guys kind of um, indicate for your lifestyle and what you kind of prefer. Um, so unfortunately, this dog um, had multiple complications, uh, but overall, we, we still got it fixed, um, and this dog went on to do pretty well. Okay, um, we're gonna move to a different joint now. Uh, we're gonna go to uh, cranial cruciate ligament disease. Um, so the word cruciate literally just means to cross over or to form across. Um, the cruciate ligaments are kind of two bands of tissue um, located between each stifle, which is similar to like our knee joint, uh, where they join the femur and then the tibia. Uh, the one ligament runs from the inside to the outside, and then the other runs from the outside to the inside. So they cross over each other in the middle. Um, in dogs and cats, they're called the cranial and caudal cruciate ligaments. But in humans, we have similar structures called their anterior and posterior. So if you ever heard anyone tear um, the ACL, that, that is the cranial cruciate ligament. Uh, there is a question in the chat. What would a hip be like with leg perths? Great question. Um, so leg perths disease, I'll go back to the hip. Um, is an avascular necrosis, meaning uh, the vessels that supply this leg um, basically, for, for unknown reasons, stop working. They, they don't work. Um, and so we start getting necrosis of this um, femoral head. Usually the pelvis is spared and all of this is fine, uh, but basically the bone is not going to have blood supply and it's just going to start uh, for lack of a better word, uh, dying. Um, and we start seeing well, a lucency around this bone. So instead of more bone being added, bone is taken away. Um, I should, that would have been a great example to add, but uh, leg purse is gonna be uh, eating away of bone instead of adding bone. And um, not that it would be this smooth, but if it is chronic and lasts for a while, it would basically eat away the femoral head and you would be left like this. Um, but a semi-painful um, process as the dog goes through this. So good question. Um, let's see, what else about crani cranial cruciate? So similar to an ACL in humans, um, commonly this injury is caused by a twisting injury of the knee and it's not always traumatic. It's not like the dog has to be hit by a car and the knee joint completely moves and lacerates one of these. Uh, it's actually usually a degenerative disease, um, in middle-aged or older dogs, but, uh, the ligament itself starts deteriorating and getting weak, um, that can cause the tear. And so, in some dogs, it can be as simple as like just running and turning quickly, like when playing fetch. Or in some dogs, especially our, our very large breed dogs that have a chronic degeneration of this, it can be as simple as like stepping over a log. Um, that's not as common of a history uh, that I hear though. Um, in this, again, um, similar to hip dysplasia, obese dogs appear to be more predisposed, um, not only the weight gain. So one, it's, it's the amount of weight being put on these joints and ligaments, but two, fat, one of the recent studies has shown that fat actually um, releases inflammatory um, cells or hormones for lack of a better word, hormones um, that cause a lot of inflammation around the joint, uh, leading to a weakening of these structures. So um, fat not only adds more weight, but causes, uh, can help increase inflammation, which is bad. Um, okay, I'll show you a normal stifle. Um, so the one is from the side view on the left and one is from the front. The femur comes down and that extra little blob of bone is our patella on top. Um, and then it connects to the tibia. So 
I want you guys to notice that these bones are relatively smooth, right? There's, there's not lumpy bumpy, um, no extra bone formation. This joint space is nice and open. Um, and then within here, you've got a nice little fat opaque, right? So this is fat, it's dark. This is also fat between muscle, if you can see this guy. So a nice little fat pad in the front part of that knee. Um, we'll go to our patient. Um, so working on the hind limb still and knee. We have a five-year-old male neutered lab. Um, the owner has noticed a mild lameness during walks and sometimes limps for a couple um, hours <laughs> after playing fetch. Um, but yesterday he yelped when he was chasing a ball and then was limping on his left hind and that has not improved at all. Um, there's a question in the chat. Was a study about how fat can affect joints specific to the knee or to all joints? To all joints. So it's not just the knee, it's elbows, hips. Um, I feel like obese dogs tend to have more hip and knee issues, but certainly all joints um, are going to be affected. Um, so this is a very common history. Um, we have a mild lameness, right? So that's kind of a degeneration of, of the ligament. It's starting to weaken and he kind of limps now and then. It's not very um, significant, but then all of a sudden he's playing fetch and he yelps and, and, and then he can't walk on it very well. That's pretty common. Um, so this is an example um, in our x-rays of a cranial cruciate ligament tear. So compared to our normal, all of this is lumpy bumpy. And this fat pad is still present, but we have a lot of this soft tissue or fluid opacity in the front of the joint and extending behind the joint. All of that is joint fluid. So when a joint gets angry, it is going to increase the amount of fluid trying to lubricate the joint more. Um, and so this joint is angry. Um, we still have good um, space between here, but this, this side is, is not smooth. And this is relatively mild, but it's irregular. We also have this nice little point here, which is not normal. I'll show you one more example. Um, one of the other common findings. So in the ex last example, I said, yeah, you know what? There's some new bone formation, some arthritis basically, and some fluid within the joint. It's pretty convincing of a craniocrucial ligament tear, but you know, I, I can't say for sure. Uh, but in our dogs, mid, um, mid to large uh, breed dogs, it, it's a CCL tear until proven otherwise. This is very similar to the previous dog I showed you. This is even more fluid. So you can see that fat pad get really squished up front. This is gonna be more severe and more telling. So now the little um, piece of my femur here should be sitting directly above this little bump of the tibia. It is not sitting above this little bump of the tibia, meaning this bone, the femur is moved backwards compared to what it should be moved, it should be up here and it's not. Meaning that cranial ligament is no longer doing its job holding it forward. It's completely torn and it is, the um, femur has uh, slipped kind of backwards. Um, and we can still see that huge amount of um, fluid within the joint uh, by that soft tissue on both sides. And the joint space here, is very much collapsed compared to normal. And that's because this has, has slipped back. Um, so there's, there's quite a few different things that we can do to treat this. Um, mild cases in the early part of disease, again, rest, anti-inflammatories, maybe some joint supplements, um, an exercise program, um, weight loss, et cetera. But once we have a true tear, the really only way um, is, is surgical. Um, and there's three different surgical techniques that I'll talk about. One is a TPLO. It stands for tibial plateau leveling oste osteotomy. And that's, that's a lot of words, but basically what we do is we come in and cut the back of the tibia um, and we basically move it backwards because we need 
it to sit underneath the femur, right? The femur moved back, so we have to move the tibia back. And one of the ways we do that is to cut it, slide it backward, and then apply this plate to hold it in place. And I have an x-ray example of that. Um, this is what it looks like. Um, so now that little bump in our tibia is sitting right under our femur. And this dog is nice and happy. This bone will eventually um, form new bone and connect those two pieces. And then the implant can either stay in there for life or it can, it can come out depending on if it gets infected or anything like that. So that is one surgical fix. Um, another surgical fix is a TTA, a tibial tuberosity advancement. So the tibia is this bottom bone and the tuberosity just literally means the front part of it. So we cut the tibial tuberosity um, off, but instead of completely pulling it um, off, we just move it forward a little bit, um, which helps pull the femur forward just slightly. It's, it's not very big movement, um, but it helps pull it forward and try to kind of hook it back up over the bump that we need it to be. And then we plate that just like before. And I'll show you an example of that one. Um, so this is a kind of a fancy plate for what was done there. And this dog actually, they did not cut it all the way. Um, so there's just different um, variations of it, um, but that is that. Is that. Uh, question in the chat, what about the remaining new point of bone at the rear and the ledge created when it was slid forward? Um, in the um, TPLO, I believe you're talking about. Let me go back. So the new point of bone back here and up here usually causes zero issues. Um, it sounds weird because it looks like it's going right into the joint, but over time, the body will actually remodel this and make it nice and smooth and it will no longer be super excessively pointy. Um, and then same back here. Um, that is generally not as sharp and relatively smooth and um, we don't actually have to do anything about that. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, okay, so this has a couple different fashions. This is just the example um, that I could find. And then the third type is a suture. So this basically acts like the ligament, the cranial cruciate ligament, but it lives on the outside. So instead of that cranial cruciate ligament, which it's torn, you can see it's no longer connecting up here. Um, we just take it connect it to the front of the tibia and then around the side. Um, and it's just done by literal suture, non-absorbable, um, thick suture material, um, stitches. Um, sometimes though they are connected with metal clamps. Um, and so commonly this is, this is all we will see after surgery um, is just on the side um, hanging out. So, Depending on which technique we use, again, is kind of dependent on the dog's lifestyle, you know, the owner's lifestyle, um, how severe disease is, and truthfully, um, surgeon preference. A lot of times, um, you know, surgeons are very used to one thing and have really good success with it. And if you have success with something, you know, why, why change it? So. Um, okay, our next disease is going to be a luxating patella. Uh, the patella is also the kneecap. Um, it's normally located in a groove that's on the front of that femur, on the front of that thigh bone. Um, and the term luxating, again, just kind of means like out of place or dislocated. So um, this patella can move either to the left or to the right um, of where it's supposed to sit. This is super, super common in our uh, toy or small breed dogs. Uh, anything can get it, but very small breed dogs is what we see it in. So Maltese, Chihuahua, uh, Bichons, things like that. Um, and there is a, a genetic predisposition to this. Um, when the patella luxates, it, it tor puts torque or tension on our ligaments and our structures um, that shouldn't be. And then our joint, because those ligaments are 
abnormal and moved, um, it will also add a bunch of strain to our joints. Um, what else about luxating patellas? Um, oh, there's different um, categories of them. So some only luxate when I push it. Some will luxate now and then on their own, but they'll slid back to normal, slide back to normal. And then some will luxate and only move back to normal when I push it back to normal. And then the last category is it luxates and I cannot push it back. Um, a question in the chat. Why is this so common in small breeds? I had a toy poodle that both rear legs were luxated and stuck out. He walked like a cowboy. Uh, I, I guarantee you he walked like a cowboy. That is one of the most common um, things we hear. Um, why is it common in small breeds? Uh, I, I don't know. Um, some Part of the reason we think this happens is because the groove right here in the femur is not as well developed. Um, and so, it's a hereditary thing where some small breeds maybe don't develop that groove as deep. Um, and I think that's why, but that's a theory. We don't, we don't truly know um, all the reasons of why this happens. And that's kind of, unfortunately, a lot of things um, in vet med is a lot of research has gone into human med of why things happen. And we can try to correlate it, but it doesn't always transfer over. So a lot of these answers are we think it's this, but we, we truly just don't know the answer. Um, okay, so still on the hind limb, working on the knee. We have a seven-year-old female spade Yorkie. Um, she has occasional limping over the past two months um, that kind of comes and goes. But then sometimes she walks with a stiff back legs. Um, I should have added cowboy because that's very common to hear. Um, okay, so this is what it looks like. I put um, on the left is a CT image that we reconstructed into a 3D image for you. So the leg on the right, the patient's left, you can see that patella is completely moved out of this groove. So this is the groove where it should sit in like this guy, but it's sitting way over here in left field. This does look turned again, that may be real because angular limb deformities can definitely cause uh, patellar luxation. Um, one thing we see in x-rays is when the patella, which is sitting here, normally we saw it sitting up here, right? Kind of out in front, it'll sit back behind. Well, that's because it's moved to the side and backwards. So it looks from the side like it's sitting on top of, but it's, it's really not, it's sitting off to the side. Um, and in this patient, we bent its knee and took an image from the top. And you can see this is the normal groove. And it's really not that big of a groove. You can see why this huge patella didn't want to sit in there. It, there was nothing holding it. So it just slipped over. Um, OK. We kind of went through the grades, um, but depending on the grade, you may or may not surgically correct it. So usually luxating patellas are not, sometimes they can be painful, but not always actually. I would say the majority are not. Um, and it's just that the dog will learn to kick its leg sideways and pop it back into place. And that's when the grade is, is pretty mild. When it gets severe to where it can't pop it back in, um, we have to go in and make a deeper groove and actually cut out um, a, a groove for that patella to sit in just like this. And I don't think I have a radiographic example of that to show you afterward. The patella, the patella, uh, the patella basically looks normal after that. Um, okay. The next disease, um, osteochondritis to seconds. This is a long word, I'm just gonna call it OCD. Um, this is a developmental disease, very common in young animals. Um, it's an inflammatory condition. Um, basically when we, it's truly a disease of the cartilage, not necessarily of the bone. Um, so, oh, there was a question in the chat. You mentioned joint supplements when discussing mild CCL. Can you be specific in terms of supplements? Yeah, so a lot of times we'll do like a glucosamine chondroitin, we'll do omega-3s and omega-6s. Um, 
I think Adequan is one of the most common. I hate to say, as a radiologist, I don't deal with a lot of uh, drugs. <laughs> so the common names, oh, I'm so sorry, I don't know those, but um, I know there's, there's quite a few. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> um, okay, going back to OCD. Um, typically, so our poster child, large breed, fast growing dogs, and we are gonna see it in young dogs, meaning they commonly present at like six or nine months of age. Um, and I guess turns out to be more common in male dogs. However, any sex can get it. Um, we have no idea uh, why this happens. HOD, no. So HOD is a totally different disease. Um, we still don't know what causes that disease. Um, and I did not use an example of that, um, but HOD is, is totally different. Um, Let's see, nothing else about this guy. We can go and show you some radiographs. So a few of the most common locations in dogs is gonna be the shoulder, the hock joint, and those are the two most common. So I have two shoulder examples for you. This is a normal shoulder though. Um, so we have the scapula up here coming down to the humerus. Um, and again, these margins are very smooth. There's a nice joint space between uh, in the joint. Um, that's pretty much all we need to know for this disease. Uh, okay. Oh, it says hind limb. Man, I should have reread this uh, PowerPoint. This is a front limb shoulder. Um, seven month old female in uh, male intact, sorry, St. Bernard started occasionally limping on the right hind and right front both, um, they, which gets worse after play or after a really long walk. So really only after exercise or activity is when um, he's limping. Uh, so in this, I'll show you two examples. This is a more mild example, but you can see how this is relatively smooth. And then all of a sudden we kind of get this flat region. When we zoom up on it, it's a little bit more apparent. Um, and within this flat region, there's a tiny little lucency or darkness. Um, and that it kind of extends throughout here. So it's a pretty subtle change, but you can definitely see here that there's a divot within that bone and it's not nice and circular. Um, that is pretty classic. They don't commonly um, show <coughs> what I'm about to show you, which is the absolute um, like definitive answer where we still have this little roughening back here. Um, but on this view, we can actually see the flap of cartilage that is disconnected from the normal cartilage that sits there. Interestingly enough, in this dog, we also have some new bone formation, um, which is common in most joint diseases. So this is OCD, um, not a common disease. Um, although when it shows up, it is common in the shoulder and hock joint. Um, since the severity of OCDs can vary, treatment options also vary from medical management, which by now I'm assuming you can guess, cage rest, anti-inflammatories, um, usually weight loss isn't a thing. It can be if, if we're really overfeeding our puppies, but by the time we're six or nine months, um, we're not super morbidly obese, so maybe diet as well, but um, if the lameness doesn't improve, we do have to go in um, into the joint and actually take out the little fragment and smooth up that cartilage and just kind of debride this area. Um, so this is kind of a fragment of free cartilage, and then this is all that kind of lumpy bumpiness that we saw on x-rays. All right, our next disease, it kind of sounds similar. It's osteoarthritis though. So this take out, osteo just means bone. Arthritis is inflammation of the bone and joint. Um, so this is a very complex condition, um, but its mainstay is just inflammation. Um, and this is very painful usually when it happens. Um, we usually can diagnose this just on physical exam and then x-rays are, are really, really helpful. Um, this can happen in any joint at all. As you, we've kind of been talking about a lot of these other diseases, 
have a component of this arthritis, but they also had something else going on. So this is just gonna be arthritis by itself. Um, this is one of the biggest takeaways of my lecture and you guys are probably gonna get sick of me saying it, but um, weight and obesity and fat accumulation is going to be the evil stepchild of these diseases in our joints, okay? So about 25% of all dogs of different age ages will suffer from this because of their um, weight and not necessarily because of their age. So it tends to be that older dogs will get arthritis, however, not always. Um, and again, this is going back to not only does obesity put weight on those joints, but it will also um, release inflammatory mediators um, uh, causing it. Can I talk a little bit about Pano and HOD? I certainly will, um, maybe at the end, if you guys wanna um, stick around, that I can definitely do that. Uh, Pano and HOD are common. Um, another chat, I still feel like there needs to be a separate chart for sight hounds because their build is so different. Absolutely accurate. Um, so humans, cats, we are relatively the same shape, not always the same height, but we, we are really, our bone structure is relatively the same. Dogs, you take something from a chihuahua to a English bulldog, to a sight hound, to a German shepherd, Saint Bernard, you name it, there are so many different constructions of joints and the shape of their chest and their bones of the different proportions of their bones. They are so different. And I agree there needs to be a separate chart, but this is kind of a, a general idea um, of, what, of what we see. So I agree, um, but this is, this is pretty average, I would say for, for most dogs. Yes, uh, another chat says hands on the best way to tell. Absolutely, um, no dog should have a pendulous abdomen and have five inches of, it sh they should not look like an ottoman, right? They, they, you should be able to see a waist. You should be able to see a tummy tuck in any dog. So you can, you can use this um, in, in most dogs. I mean, I will even argue, you know, uh, little uh, bulldogs, you should still see a waist. Um, you should still be able to palpate easily their ribs and not have to dig in there to feel. Going to the next slide. Okay. Oh, I already showed you a normal shoulder, but here's another one. We'll go to our case. Um, this is in the forelimb shoulder. This is a seven-year-old female spade, Roddy. Um, she has mild intermittent lameness that is worth worse with exercise for about a year. So a pretty long duration, but it's been intermittent. So, we, you know, we weren't really sure what was going on. Um, this is just one example of how it can change throughout time. So this actually is the same dog that we had multiple images of over, over years um, at the university. And we start off with just this little bit of change. And if you noticed in the actual cartilage deficit that we talked about before in OCD, that was up here in the joint space. In the shoulder, arthritis is actually back here, kind of in the back part of the head. And then it starts to get a little bigger and then it gets a little bit bigger, but the body's trying to remodel it. So it's not as pointy. It's kind of starting to be a little bit more smooth. Now it's, it's still pretty big, but we're also starting to get it up here as well on the back part of our um, scapula and some over here. So now it's kind of encircling the whole joint and not just the back half. And again, this can happen in any joint. I just wanted to show you shoulder. Um, there is no magic bullet for treating arthritis. Um, in fact, once it's established, uh, we're not really treating it anymore. We're just trying to manage it because it cannot be cured. Um, and it's very complex. It, it involves so many different things from hereditary genes to diet exercise. Sometimes too much exercise is actually worse on the joints. And so it's not an easy thing. Um, also, I just thought this little guy, it must be the collar. I tell myself that every time I step on the scale. So I thought he was perfect. <laughs> 
Okay, elbow dysplasia. So we talked about hip dysplasia. Um, elbow dysplasia um, kind of involves, it involves the three different bones that make up the elbow, but it's not just one thing that we look for. It's a combination or single things. And we'll, and we'll talk about each of them. Um, it is uh, it, it is rare for one dog to have all three things we're going to talk about, but it, it's certainly possible. Um, and then again, this is hereditary. Dysplasia is a young animal condition where dysplasia just means abnormal growth or development. Um, so if we have these diseases, we, we try not to breed them um, simply because it's going to be passed down. And you guys that... Um, that have seen, you know, are well aware of these things probably know that there are um, programs out there to make sure that dogs don't have hip or elbow dysplasia and then uh, move on through the breeding cycle. So a few areas that we're going to look at is this is the humerus in blue, the ulna in yellow, and then the radius in pink. The ulna is going to be one of our biggest culprits. So it's going to have this little top portion in red called the ankyneal process, and that's also right here. It's also gonna have this other one called the coronoid process. And usually we'll say the medial coronoid process is usually the one affected and that's right here. And then um, our OCD lesions can also occur here, but these, these two are gonna be our big ones that we'll, that we'll go through. Okay, a normal elbow joint. So I see that the, the ankyneal process is here it's nice and sharp. There's no um, lumpy bumpiness to it. Um, our medial coronary process, so it comes back here behind the radius, and then it comes down and connects. So part, the medial coronary process is mostly hidden by that radius, which is a lot of times why CT actually has to help us look at this, but sometimes we can diagnose it off of radiographs. Looking on this view, um, our medial coronary process is is right here. It's this little guy. So we'll talk about the ununited ankyneal process, and that's where um, there's a growth plate um, in the ulna. Down below, there's only one growth plate, but up top, there's a growth plate here and a growth plate here. And in this dog, it's okay that this is open and that that growth plate hasn't fused yet. That's not a fracture, it's just a young dog, but this will fuse later in life. Whereas this one should have already fused and it usually should fuse, I think five to six months of age. Um, so this is an ununited ankyneal process and that uh, definitely causes changes to the elbow where, where these, this joint space is not congruent anymore. Now the fragmented coronoid process, um, that's this little bit again, uh, down on the ulna. And so this is hard to see, but if I'm following, here's our ankyneal process, okay? We're following it, the ulna down. So I'm, I'm coming right down here and we're gonna hit this end of it, coming down. And instead of being a nice sharp margin, my, I've seen so many of these, it's easy for me to see that it's really just kind of blunted and round. And over here, you can see that it's severely abnormal. It's very lumpy, bumpy. There's even this extra bit of bone that probably is broken off already. Um, not only that, but this whole joint, the radius has a lumpy, bumpy new bone here on the humerus, here on the humerus. Um, this, this joint is, is very bad. Um, this is a very significant uh, disease, uh, elbow dysplasia in this dog. Um, so, so in the formal limb, we're on the elbow. We have a one-year-old female spade golden retriever. Um, we started not wanting to go on walks or play, which is not really normal um, for her. And occasional, uh, occasionally we have limping on both um, front legs. So again, the ankyneal process should fuse at five to six months. So she's well beyond this. So we'll see if, um, if it is attached or not. Um, and these are her x-rays. Um, so this is going to be that medial coronoid. Uh, it's a little round, but not as bad as we've seen before. When I look here, coming down, though, it does not come to a nice sharp point. That bone is very blunted. Um, I mentioned neutered versus not. Is that a factor? Uh, no, typically not for these. Um, 
no there's some some joint diseases tend to affect males versus females but the um altered or not isn't isn't usually um doesn't usually correlate it's a good question um and then also on this joint this ankyneal process is uh irregular here you can also notice this joint space is very wide it's supposed to be really thin um so that is abnormal and I'll kind of, the next slide, I'll point out uh, some of these things as well. So again, um, this is abnormal. This is all abnormal. I should have put one on the radius here. That is still a little bit irregular. This doesn't come to a nice point. Also, what I forgot to mention is this bone here is more white and more opaque than it should be. Um, that joint space um, here is very wide compared to this other side. Um, so how we treat these, um, most, they're both surgical um, to some degree. And no matter what we have, they're both gonna develop arthritis later in life, even with surgical treatment. It's just getting the dog in, getting it surgically treated to help reduce the amount of arthritis uh, within the joint. Um, the ununited ankyneal process um, is going to, we're gonna remove that fragmented um, bit away from the joint. And then we can use a screw, either remove it or use a screw um, to kind of reattach it like this one. Um, the fragmented uh, medial coronary process, um, again, surgery is gonna be the treatment of choice. Um, and it's just gonna be to debride. Um, to, to debride that process and take out any fragment if it's there. Um, this does talk about the bone being cut. That is because this patient also had another disease going on that we will talk about shortly. So we're just gonna ignore that part for now. Oh, it's actually the next, the next case. Um, so this, our last one that we have is angular limb deformity. And that is either where bone or joints are not situated on the correct angle. So something is kind of skewed and it can be bone and joint. It can just affect one part of the limb. It can affect the whole limb. Um, there is really no breed disposition. Uh, maybe smaller breed dogs are more common, but um, there's no necessarily poster child for this. Um, it can be hereditary or it can also be because we have injury to the growth plate. Um, so if uh, we got stepped on, um, we had some other sort of trauma, or if we have an infectious disease that kind of goes to the joints and causes inflammation um, in, in development period that it, it won't go. Um, so we have um, a four month old male neutered basset hound. Um, he has been limping since he was adopted as a puppy. Um, okay, so this is, again, a 3D rendered CT image, and this is also a CT image, and then this is the x-ray. So I just wanted to show you that this, uh, these two are the same dog, this is a different patient, but this um, radius is very curved um, compared to normal, and that's not just how we've positioned it. It truly, the access should be coming down, but oop, it, it made a turn this way, which is not normal. The reason this dog, that it happened to this dog is because this physis, the growth plate down here um, in the ulna closed way too early. So this dog actually, I think if I remember correctly, got stepped on by the owner on accident when it was really, really young, caused inflammation of this growth plate. The growth plate said, whoa, whoa, I'm gonna close up shop really quickly. Um, and then it fused, well, if this bone is no longer growing at the rate this bone is, this bone still is gonna grow. And in order to do so, it has to curve, right? It has to bend to fit the same length. Um, and when it does that, um, you end up with severe joint incongruity. This, this elbow is not put together at all. It's like the pieces are taken apart and they haven't been put back together again. In this case, it's because the growth plate of the radius closed. You can see this nice little growth plate on the ulna. It's, it's not there on the radius. It just hasn't um, been long enough for the ulna to try to bend yet. 
And so that's um, one way that angular limb deformities can occur. Um, we treat these uh, usually surgically. By the time that we are noticing the pet having issues, uh, they, they need surgical treatment for it. So what we do is we go in and cut either just a single slice into bone, or we go in and cut a actual chunk of bone from the bad bone, the one that the growth plate closed, and we'll go and cut that out to allow it to continue to grow and allow the other bone to continue to grow and try to correct that deformity. And so that can be done just in a cast or it can be done with kind of an external uh, fixator like this. And in this case, this was such a bad case that we had to cut both uh, the radius and ulna. And you can see just how bad um, I believe the image before where I said they weren't put together right, well, that's, this was, that was this case. Um, we had to go in and cut both to allow growth and allow this elbow to kind of re-put re together, I guess, if you will. Um, that's all the cases I have for you. Um, I can definitely talk about panosteitis and HOD. Um, but I'll see if there's any questions before I do that. Not so far. Okay. Um, let me just, I don't have a photo of it. So I am just going to Google, um, a radiograph of it and I'll explain it. I'll pick a good one and then, um, I'll explain it from there. Dog. And osteitis. So panosteitis is a inflammation of the bone. So pan means multiple. Osteo means bone, and then itis is inflammation. Um, random and not brought up, but for osteosarcoma, are there early signs that can be detected? Yes, I will show you osteosarcoma as well. Um, so we have multiple bones that are inflamed. That is literally what the panosteitis breaks down to be, and this is common in young dogs. Um, I believe it's common up to 11 months of age, um, especially in our fast growing dogs. So our big dogs are going to be most common. But what we're going to see is not necessarily necessarily changes to the outside of the bone. Uh, let me see if I can click this and if it'll blow up bigger. Sorry, my internet is so slow. So we don't really have changes to the outside of the bone. We have changes to the inside of the bone. So look down here at the tibia. Our cortex, the outside of the bone is really dense and white. Um, whereas the inside of the bone is more uh, lucent because our bone marrow is made up a lot of fat. So this is kind of almost a fat opacity, right? This is the fat pad in front of our knee. It's not quite there, but it's close. So our bone marrow is made of fat. When we have inflammation of, of young bone, we're going to have this kind of increased opacity. And you can kind of see almost a circular um, lesion within this inner part of the bone. Um, another very, very common that this dog is showing really well sign that we'll see are these little horizontal um, hyperechoic lines. So that is going to be um, kind of similar to the Morgan line that we talked about in the cycle, but not, not the same thing. It's not at the joint. It's just um, little growth rings, if you will. Any questions about pano? I, I have one, Jay. It's Nancy. Mm -hmm. The medullary cavity is extended through the length of this bone. You see how that how lucent it is distally? Yes. That, so that entire thing is the medullary cavity. Yes, that's a great that's, that's great. So it's in our long bones. The majority of our long bones is actually medulla, medullary cavity. So up down here is cortical bone. It's it's the not spongy, it's the cancellous, the cortical thick, dense. Right. And then starting at the physis, 
going up all the way through the middle is a canal called the medullary cavity and pano affects that whole canal. So how much more fragile are the bones then? Because the spongy bone is going to be surrounding that medullary cavity. Yep, um, usually not fragile. So it doesn't affect the actual spongy bone. It just affects the um, bone marrow and soft tissue within it. Got it. I shouldn't say it doesn't affect it. Yes, inflammation is going to affect it, but what does bone do when it's inflamed? It lays down more bone. Right. right? Yeah. So um, usually, usually fragility, fragility is not, not an issue. And this is something that's going to come on. A lot of times we'll hear a young dog that has intermittent lameness. So it'll come, then it'll disappear. Then it'll come, it'll disappear. It might be in the front leg, it might be in the back leg, it might be in the left front, then the right front. And it can affect any long bone. Hmm. So any, any leg bone really can have this. Most commonly femur, humerus, radius, and ulna, but it, it can affect any. I think right. Sally okay. asked a question. I just saw that now. Oh, hold on, I gotta scroll up because there was another one that popped in. Uh, Sally, okay, we've had six German Shepherds, different lines, two have had Pano, one had HOD, all were normal in the end. Yes, exactly. So Pano is, think of Pano as growing pains. That's literally all it is. It's inflammation of the bone. The bone's trying to remodel and grow. Um, dogs will grow out of this. This is not a, it is hereditary, but it, it's not a end-all be-all. Um, this doesn't affect the, the dog long-term at all. Um, HOD, and let me read the next question just to make sure it's not about Pano and then we'll, we can go to HOD. Would one good takeaway to be to keep your puppy young dog on the lean side and to acquire a dog from the responsible breeder? I realized some of the issues you noted has or had a root cause being stepped on or running after a ball. I'm hoping to find out if there's things that owners can do to try and avoid these joint issues. Uh, you hit the nail on the head, Dory. One thing, young, especially big breeds, any, I mean, I have a cattle dog and a border collie and I'm even careful with them. And I consider those medium sized dogs, right? Anything medium or big, keeping puppies on a diet and on the thin side. So I showed you that scale, right? Sometimes we, some vets use a one to nine, some use a one to five. Ideal in the one to five is a three. I very much do not go over three in your puppies. On the one to nine scale, ideal is four to five mm -hmm. in an adult dog. I keep my puppies at a four. Um, at least until they're a year, year and a half of age. Um, and always, yes, responsible breeders are, are very important, especially when they're, they're doing things like making sure that these hereditary diseases aren't, aren't present in their um, <laughs> lines, right? So if, if I know that my dog has elbow dysplasia and I purposely go breed it because I, that's not, that's not caring for the breed that you are breeding. That is wanting to sell puppies because you can. Um, unfortunately, I, that's how I feel about it. Um, but yes, responsible breeders are very important to truly make the best breeds that, that are, that are there, right? And we can't escape everything. Um, some breeds are just predisposed to some things, but there are some things we can, we can help out with for sure. I think you mentioned you were going to talk a little bit about osteosarc. Yes. Okay. Let's do osteosarc and then we can do HOD too. If, if people have time. Osteosarc is way more common than HOD. So let's do that. Osteosarcoma radiograph. Um, so osteosarcoma is a primary um, tumor of bone. Uh, meaning it hasn't spread from a, some other site. It is a bone, true bone tumor. Um, and my internet is not loading, um, but I can still talk about it. So osteosarcoma, a good classic way to remember this is flee the elbow, seek the knee. So perfect example just popped up. This is an example of osteosarc, it's seeking the knee, meaning it's close to the knee. So distal femur, proximal tibia, right around that knee area. Or in the elbow, it's gonna flee the elbow, meaning way up here in the shoulder, that's away from elbow, or way down here in the carpus or wrist, it's still away from the elbow. So that's like, 
the super common areas that we're going to see osteosarc. Some are going to be whether you're early in disease or late in disease, right? Because tumors need time to grow. Um, you can see things like this, where it's this nice big geographic lysis, meaning that bone is being eaten away. You can see things where it has it started off as bone being eaten away, but then all of a sudden the bone got so angry. What does bone do when it's angry? It lays down more bone, but not in normal fashion. It lays down this really spiculated, gross looking bone. These also will eat away at the cortex. So you see how this cortex is nice and thick. We get down here, it's expanded, but look how thin that bright white line is. It gets really thin. And arthritis doesn't affect the cortex of bones. It might affect the outside, but it does not affect the inside and cause thinning of that thick outer layer. Yeah, there was a comment, my young dog had it in the proximal humerus. That is very common. Up here, flee the elbow, seek the knee. That is where osteosarc likes to live. Any questions about osteosarc? Oh, I will say um, osteosarc is a very, very bad tumor. So some tumors are relatively benign. Some are very scary and uh, cause very bad things. And osteosarc is one of those. So truthfully, uh, the, the treatment of choice for osteosarc is to amputate the limb, um, to do a full workup and make sure that it hasn't spread to other lymph nodes, to the abdomen, to the lungs, because this, this cancer can spread everywhere. Can you see it early? You can. Um, it sometimes it's so early that all we have is um, a little bit of kind of wispiness in here, but the dog is super painful pain and not just pain moving, not walking pain, palpation. When I press on that bone, it is severely painful. And so a lot of times we've actually diagnosed this via CT because it's just, it's much more robust. We can see it in individual little slices, not just as one big bone, um, but you can see it um, early on x-rays. I'm trying to see if any of these examples have an early, most of these are the pretty severe ones. Um, it's fairly common in my breed greyhound, so I'm considering doing regular x-rays from now on. Um, I'm that traumatized. Absolutely. I, I don't blame you, um, especially in its, yes, uh, big, large growing breeds get it, but any breed can get it. There's really no rhyme or reason for um, osteosarc and no rhyme or reason for cancer. You know, we also say cancer is a older dog disease. It's not. We if we see it so commonly in young dogs and it, it breaks my heart. Um, Dory, my first Roddy uh, BYB product, didn't know better at the time, had osteosarc, terrible disease. It sure is. Um, unfortunately, is, it is relatively common and it, it sure sucks. Oh, this one, Whew. this one is so bad. It's eaten away most of that bone right there. It looks like that must be the ulna, but th there's no bone left. Um, that that's bad. That's progressive. And the hard part is, is it can grow at different rates. So sometimes we won't know it's there until it's, it's really present. Like this dog, I can't say for sure, but I guarantee you the owner, I would hope not that the owner wasn't just like, oh yeah, he's fine. He's fine. Sometimes this can happen very quickly. And sometimes it takes a long time for it to occur. So uh, progression of it is, is kind of a, uh, variable. Um, I will move into HOD just because I see um, an image on my screen right now that relatively resembles HOD. So I'll show you this, talk about it, and then I'll pull up a, a good photo. HOD is going to be common in the distal, the bottom end of our legs, most commonly radius and ulna. And what happens is it stands for hypertrophic osteodystrophy. So hypertrophic just meaning increased amount um, osteo bone, so increased amount of bone. And then dystrophy is just abnormal location. So we end up, this is, it says osteosarc, but uh, this looks very similar to HOD. HOD doesn't affect the medullary uh, cavity as commonly. It can, 
but not as common. But it also has this big soft tissue swelling. And you can tell this bone is new, but it's not really eaten away. It's not a huge lysis like this guy. Um, so it has new bone, but it's more kind of like bones been added to the side. So let me do HOD. Sometimes I wonder when I Google images if they truly are what they look like because that uh, definitely looks like HOD. Okay, and sometimes they are very subtle. So let me find, yeah, this example looks very similar to that last one. Uh, let me just see if that'll blow up just a little bit. So it doesn't commonly affect uh, joints. Um, it's usually the distal, the bottom end, um, either at our, usually at our wrist, um, and radius or, or ulna is affected. And then, yeah, it's this kind of, can you see this bone is actually, it, it's new bone and it's not necessarily truly smooth. It's a little irregular, but it's more smooth than that really speculated stuff we saw um, on osteosarc. Um, that is, that's really common um, to see it like this. This disease is not common. Um, it's an autoimmune disease. Um, so no really trauma, it's not a tumor, um, it's, the, it's the immune system uh, that does it. Let me see if this is a good example. Yeah, I would say that's a good, a good example. This little new bone, it is irregular, but it's more smooth and not um, spike-like. What else? Oh, I, I didn't mention that. Uh, because it's down, so I, I mentioned that it's usually down here in the bottom part of the limb, but that's because um, we have parts of our bone. Uh, the long shaft part is the diaphysis. The epiphysis is basically the part above the growth plate right here. The metaphysis is the portion between that. It, it affects that. Portion. So it can extend a little ways, um, but it usually doesn't creep up, up into the mid part of the long bone. Um, I'll keep scrolling unless you guys have questions. Any other questions, folks? Oh, and not to be confused. I'm glad this case popped up. Not to be confused with HO, which is hypertrophic osteopathy. I know they sound so similar, but that is a disease of bone and lung, um, not just bone. This tends to be bone. Um, I'm, glad, I'm glad that case popped up. Yeah, I don't know. This must be a very severe example that's not, not typical. So it usually doesn't extend up here, but yeah. Well, if there's no more questions, I surely appreciate you guys coming to listen. I had fun putting this together, so. Fascinating, Dr. Harris. Oh, it's fascinating. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. I love my job so much. So to share it with you guys is, I just, I love it. Oh, thanks everyone. Yeah, this is, that was very nice of you. All right, folks, I'm going to stop recording. <laughs>